This is about uh, 100 meters, 150 meters into the race. Germany at 44 in the lead. Ireland, they're going to be Olympic champions later on. Not in the lead, they're right here. A stroke rate 42. So to me, it appears like the Irish are one of the boats that actually judge their race quite well. There's a certain pace they can go and they can build over the course of the entire race. They don't have to lead at the start. I mean, of course, everybody would like to lead from the start to make it clear, but it's not that easy. Italy, high rating 45. So Italy is the highest rating boat here, just behind Belgium and Czech Republic of 43. But again, the race between Ireland and Germany is actually the interesting one. At the beginning, Italy is with the pack of the top three, but Germany is leading everybody. That's essentially what it's going to look like for the first part of the race. What I want to talk about right now is the technique of the three leading boats. I'm going to start off with Italy because this is one of the few shots we get. This is an early stage of the race. To me, it seems like the two are having a pretty short stroke. The stroke guy here, there is a motion around the hip joint just to get the blades into the water. And that's not something rare. We see this in quite a few of these boats here. The next thing we see is an arm bend on the port side. So a lot of people ask me, say, ha, how do you do this when you row left over right? And how should you get the right hand closer to the body? Well, a lot of people simply do this, tighten up the right arm. Is it effective? Uh, no, <laughs> not at all. Are the good ones doing it? Well, Olympic bronze medal, of course. The best way, in my humble opinion, is to set up the boat in a way where you can play a bit with the shoulder girdle and you can keep your arms as relaxed as possible, but that requires to have more space between the left and the right pin. So the orlock uh, height difference needs to be greater than usual. At least 12 millimeters is 1.2 centimeters. These rowers, and this is something you have to consider, they have been around for a while. And if you've ever worked with people who've been around for a while, been successful for quite a bit, and the two Italians have been hugely successful, it is very difficult to change things. Because whenever you change something, uh, initially, you will most likely see the watts and the, or, or the splits on the water drop, initially, because the muscle memory needs to be set in a different way. Now, most of these athletes don't want to do that. They don't want to see their splits drop. They don't trust in the process. They just, they have to qualify every year for, from, from scratch and have to be good every year from scratch. And there's no weak moment they can allow themselves. So they cannot, they cannot afford to see their splits drop. Would it be more effective? Oh yeah, absolutely. But that's also a matter of how federations are wired and how they function. If you're consistently selected, judged, uh, supervised, monitored, there's no, there's no calm time. Just, okay, I'm going to change my technique. It's going to make me slower for a week or a month or two months, and then I'm going to be faster than before. That's not possible. So this is why you end up with people gradually having their own technique that is difficult to adjust in my coaching and also in my coaching history, where I knew exactly what was to do, but I, that person just wouldn't do it. It's, it's not like it's a discussion, say, I'm not going to do it. Say, yeah, but if I do it, then it'd be slower. And, say, and they act like they're trying to do it, but in reality, they're not. So this is why people end up bending their arms. This is why people end up pivoting too early. This is why people do start to do this. There's a fear to change technique because the current level is so high. And these are extremely high levels that there is a massive concern. What if I change technique and it makes me slower and can't get back on time? And this is why you end up with technique issues like these. Interestingly, with the Bauman, it, this is not the case. So super relaxed, super late. Well, a massive upper body. So for me, this is um, almost picture perfect technique. The way he starts the drive with his legs, nice leg drive, uh, super patient with his upper body. He's got a long torso. And then a massive pivot before the arms engage. And that's a typical Italian style. You cannot see the dynamics here, but late, 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 whoop. That's actually quite a whip effect here. Um, you see this dynamic effect? Let's go back a bit more. Watch the bow guy of the Italians. Whoop! It's like drive effect, drive whip over. And that is excellent. But the issue is if both of them are not doing it, you again create different influence on the boat. So let's see stroke guy. Bends quite a bit early, works over the top of his shoulders, just like the German bow guy. 
and that creates different force curves. Try this one out. If you don't have a rowing machine available right now, just go to a door, try to contract your shoulders and try to pull this way. You will probably have a different effect in lowering your shoulders, bring your shoulders down, bring them forward a bit and then try to pull. If you lower your shoulders, you engage your, your lat a bit more, maybe your triceps, maybe your chest a bit more, but these muscles are almost directly connected to the rest of the core. This is where your center of, of body weight is, your center of gravity. Now, if you go over the top of your shoulders, you have to contract a hell of a lot of muscles in order to get to that point. So this is why high shoulders are never as effective. But again, there's the point where if you are at a certain level, you are not going to change this, especially if you've been hugely successful before just like the Germans, just like the Italians. These are um, exceptionally successful crews. To sum it up, between the two Italians, there is a difference. You just you can see how the, how the stroke eye picks up with an early rotation, and they have different force curves. I'm 100% that their force curves must be different. To me, it looks like the, the bow guy actually has an earlier pickup of force than the stroke guy, but the stroke guy has an earlier peak but the curve flattens out. I've done a lot of work on a by rower, so I think I can estimate that. I would be very curious to see these two, see their force curves and how they roll in a 2K environment, not low steady state, 2K environment. That is very interesting, 250 meter mark. To me, it looks like um, the bow guy has an earlier pickup of force, so it probably would look like this and would also almost have a plateau. Um, in low steady state with this technique, you would actually not have a plateau, but a late peak. But as the boat speed is so high, what, in, what he ends up having is a plateau. And so the x-axis is the timeline and this is the force in Newton. Now, if you look at the stroke guy, to me, it appears like he takes more time to pick up. The reason why is that uh, if you add an, a rotation and you bend your arms, the blade doesn't lock horizontally. It goes deeper into the water. If it goes deeper into the water, you don't have the same amount of connection. The moment he has connection, he's got a lot of tension behind it with the bent arms and the rotation of the upper body. And that is where um, you create that peak. Now, the problem is, as, as uh, we move on, the, the body motion is not sufficient anymore to create the plateau of the bow guy. So what happens is that there is actually a drop and a fade out. Now, this, this may be not accurate, it may be completely wrong, but that's just my estimate of what it looks like and what curves look like if you move in a certain way. And that is, I think, the reason why the Italians could not keep up uh, with the Irish and with the Germans. This is a brilliant shot of the Germans. If we watch them row, the way they row is very, very good, very good. And that is a different technique they have now than they will have of the 1500 or 1750 meter mark. What changes is the bow guy, so Jonathan Rommelmann's shoulder work. I think this is one of his weak points where the more tired he becomes, the more he contracts the shoulders. Because this is not a natural position where you can engage the large muscle groups. You have to work over the top of the shoulders and engage a lot of small muscle groups. Now they will become tired quickly. Why does it do that? I don't know. What I can tell you is that a lot of these very successful athletes, and Robermann is one of the most successful lightweights in Germany ever, they attain certain habits and patterns that work out for them to achieve their huge level of success. Could they be faster with a different technique? I think so. But as an athlete, as I said before, you always have to make a decision. You have to weigh off. Is it worth it risking to drop your pace to relearn a motion that you have practiced for probably a million or more strokes or many million strokes? Or would you rather become very good at rowing the way you row and work your way up from there and rather work on a physiological component? From a coach's perspective, I think it makes more sense to work on your technique because every step you take is more effective later on. But again, these two had to prove themselves on and on and on and on. So there was probably no time to relearn things. And this is why everybody kind of sticks 
to, to, to their technique. And of course, they try, they try to adapt as much as possible. Could it be more professional? Could it be a higher level? Yes, if the environment were different. So if these two were pretty much the double for Germany for four years, you could change it a lot. But almost nobody has that security. Let's look at the technique in details. Let's look at Rommelmann first because we just talked about it. He starts the drive with a rotation. It's quite an early rotation here. See this? Just like the stroke eye of the Italians. Early rotation and already high shoulders. You can see the difference between Osborne's, so the stroke guy's shoulders, and the bow guy's shoulders. Now, in that at that stage, 250 into the race, the shoulders are actually pretty relaxed and low. I will show you just in a moment what they looked like at the 1500. You can see the finish, interestingly. At the finish, the shoulders go up more, and there's a direct connection from legs to arms. The arms contract more and more and more as the drive progresses. So there's not that, if you compare this to the bow guy of the Italians, let's look at him. He does the drive, uses his mass to hang on, pivots with his mass and bends later on. This is what these levers are perfect at. But the way the German bow guy uses them is that he bends progressively as he uses an actually stronger lever, namely the upper body. Now you could argue, okay, okay, why is it that the Germans were faster than the Italians? I think that the Germans overall had more congruent force curves and maybe better physiology. Rommelmann and, and Osborne, both of them are extremely fit and strong and very, 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 um, they have extremely high endurance capacities. And Osborne's endurance capacity, I think, is, is well known to everybody. He's a pro cyclist now, and he actually did both for a while. What is interesting is the way Omnimon is the bad guy here, cuts off the finish. It's almost the shoulders in a forward rotation. I personally think that this is a very good thing to do because there's a lot of tension here, and bringing the shoulders back doesn't make you longer in the water. It's, it's useless at that stage. So doing this, I think, is a very good thing very well thought out and it also helps you to bring the shoulders forward quicker that's good i think the way he brings the shoulders forward is over the top it's not that low surf on the tray thing you always have to keep in mind we're watching people at one of the most important races of their entire career an olympic final so there are different rules in terms of focus on technique. You want to succeed foremost. It is probably mean to judge what we see here, but that's the only footage we've got. Let's look at Jason Osborne, Strokeman. His, his drive starts with a very, very loose low shoulder, and he's actually hunched his in, in his upper back. He already engages his arms now, but he's able to hold the upper body a bit longer. Also, he engages his arms mid leg drive when the upper body starts to engage. That is very interesting. So both of them do the leg drive and the moment they start to use the upper body, they start to use the arms as well. Again, compare this to the bow guy of the Italians, right here. You leg drive, uses the upper body weight, pivots. I think that one feature of the Germans here may possibly of all the other gazillion reasons, may possibly one of the reasons why they made silver, not gold. And they're clearly set out to, to take gold. It does look very smooth, relaxed, but it's very much with his with their arms. Your arms are, are not as strong as your upper body and not as heavy as your upper body. So it's not the same amount of force that you can create. But if you bend your arms and you try to create full force with an upper body swing, you actually corrupt the amount of force you can transfer by engaging a weaker lever. And then you have the weakest link in the chain activated, which is the arms. The looser the arms are, the more extended, the more they can transfer. Try to hang on a bar for five minutes. Would you hang like this? You probably wouldn't. Just a brief note. At the halfway mark, the Germans were still in the lead, the Irish were closing up on them, and the Italians were already almost a full length behind. That shows you 
how fierce that fight and battle for the gold medal was. That's the 1750 meter mark. So that's an unfair comparison because they are at the final stages of the race where technique is usually less effective. Strokes become shorter because the course ability is simply inexistent anymore. But nevertheless, what, what is left of their technique? And I, I try to get an early shot as well, but there isn't any good one. The way they were, of course, they bent their arms as well. A lot of arm contraction, but it's not as massive as with the Germans. The moment they start to drive, both of them have pretty low shoulders, a stroke eye, a bit higher shoulders. And interestingly, their super patient and their pivot is very much simultaneously. Leg drive, shoulder arm contraction a bit, okay. Patient and around perpendicular. Your oars are now in a perfect angle to attack. This is where both of them pivot. That joint pivot around perpendicular for me is the reason why they won. There, there's a phenomenon. If you rode a double and you have a certain setup in terms of gearing, it feels too hard in a double when your force curves are incongruent. So you have to adjust it to make it lighter. This may have been the issue with the Italians. It feels too soft from one stroke to the next one if your force curves are congruent. And I think the congruency of force curves with the Irish is greater than with the Italians and the Germans. The Germans may have equally congruent force curves to be precise, but on an overall scale of effectiveness, the Irish were more effective because of their perpendicular based pivot. Is there a bit of a washout? Yeah, who cares? I mean, 200 meters to the finish line, Olympic gold in your hands. <laughs> who cares about a washout, seriously? Once more, recovery. And this is where strokes are already pretty short. So Olympic final, 1800 meters road, this is what is still left in being in the lead. Leg drive, perpendicular pivot, boom. That is for me, that is for me the reason why the Irish were able to pull ahead. And that is also for me the reason why they were able to pick up the stroke rate. Their stroke rate was higher than the German stroke rate. So the argument should not be, well, their stroke rate was higher. The question is, why were they able to get the stroke rate up? As everybody knows, stroke rate has nothing to do with recovery speed. It has more to do with the drive speed. So if you're able to push the boat past that anchored blade quicker, because you lever together, you, you create joint leverage, then you create a higher stroke rate. And that is what the Irish did. There may be many, many more factors to this race, but just looking at that difference here, Irish and the Germans making their own battle. This is where I said initially, there were essentially two races going on, one for the gold, and then more, one maybe for the bronze with the Czechs and the Italians. But the Italians, again, a length up. And if you have almost two lengths of open water between silver and bronze, good Lord, that's a lot of lead to have. With this being said, I'm gonna close this video analysis. There are so many more factors to talk about as usual. I cannot mention everything. I usually pick out one or two things that interest me where I think, oh, that is probably a deciding point. Look at the time, 6.06. And that is staggering. I'm very much looking forward to your comments. What do you think? What do you know about this race? What is a bit of background info you can provide for the community? If you want to work with me, go to aramtraining.com. And uh, if you want to discuss more about this race, go to rowing.zone, the rowing enthusiasts rowing platform. See you in the next race. Thank you very much for watching and subscribing. I hope it was worth your time. I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.